are watching T Radio V, Radio in TV. The Social Action Media Network and T Radio V present Creating Good Work Live with your hosts, Ron Schultz and Greg Franks. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Creating Good Work Live where we are dedicated to bringing you the finest in social innovators and social entrepreneurs hard at work to uh, solve many of our most pressing social issues. I'm Ron Schultz. And I'm Greg Franks. Welcome. So today uh, we have a what I think is going to be a great show for you. Our, our two guests today are both veterans in their fields. Uh, one with local government and community revitalization, and the other is a, a master of communication strategy within the political world. And uh, we're pleased you could be with us today. Thank you. Uh, so let's let's move into it. Well, so Bob, I think th perhaps the best place for us to begin is by asking you the fundamental question here, and that, tell us about where we could find Northeast San Fernando Valley. Okay, the Northeast San Fernando Valley is a portion of the city of Los Angeles for the most part. Uh, it's located in, of course, the San Fernando Valley, <laughs> strange as it seems, and it's uh, the area to the east of the 405 freeway and basically, if you're familiar with the streets, to the north of Roscoe Boulevard. So it's about a quarter of the valley. It's got a population of about 400,000. It's about the size of Cleveland and a little bit larger. Wow. So let me, before we before we jump into questions for you about this about this process, I'll tell you why this is relevant. Uh, Bob is uh, uh, current program is the uh, Northeast Val San Fernando Valley Sustainability and Prosperity Strategy, which he, uh, he finished writing I think last night, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, has been a process of how many months has this been going on? Fifteen months. Fifteen yeah. months, and so uh, this is a program that. Uh, um, has been uh, is looking at the whole revitalization of this quadrant up in the northeast San Fernando Valley. So that that may make may make all this a little bit more relevant to you. And, and we're glad you're here, Bob. Why? Thank you. So tell us about the strategy. What is your strategy for the northeast? Well, the the difficulty. Let me start from the beginning. Uh, what has come down the pike recently has been a number of mandates from the state of California mm -hmm. uh, on local planning which some of the local planners are not too thrilled about. But in any event, uh, we have something called SB 375, which requires us to prepare, or requires jurisdictions to prepare uh, sustainable community strategies. I know they try to think of longer names for these things, but that's about <laughs> as far as they could get. And, and each jurisdiction, each city will have to prepare their own sustainable community strategy as part of their planning process. And the way that works is they need to show that they can reduce greenhouse gases over the next four or five years by about 8% from 2005 levels, mm -hmm. and then by even more by 2035. And the idea here is cutting down on greenhouse gases relating to uh, light cars and pickup trucks. And so uh, the way you do that, obviously, is you put things closer to other things, and you provide transportation as an alternative whether it be public transportation or what they call active transportation, which is walking, biking, and that sort of thing. Uh, and you have to plan for those things. Well, uh, when they talked about this, they came up with what they thought was a good idea by trying to find underserved communities. So we thought in the San Fernando Valley, of course, the Northeast Valley is a place that's been home to uh, landfills, uh, dumps, uh, quarries, a lot of heavy industry, a lot of dirt in the air and that that would be the most challenging and the demographics are pretty challenging as well because uh, obviously in the interest of social justice you talk about the fact that uh, the folks that live there tend to be poor people people of color so it's a bit of a challenge to try to see how you can make this all make sense and if you can make it work there you can make it anywhere mm -hmm. so the key words for SCAG Southern California Association of Governments would be locational efficiency Put the holes, put the houses closer to where the jobs are. Put the houses closer to where the shopping is. How long would such an initiative take from beginning to end? It's it's a, it's an endless uh, effort. It's going to probably take until 2035 for some of this to play out. Uh, the first thing you do is identify what it is you want to do. What your vision is. What would you like the community to look like? How do you reconcile? How do you mediate the differences between people who? want to come in and legitimately want to develop a community 
and the people who already live there who maybe don't want their community changed. They want it better, but they don't necessarily want it changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But who's fu who funded your... Uh it's funded by a grant from the Southern California Association of Governments, yep. and uh, uh, it's part of their sustainable community strategy for, uh, the SCAG is uh, responsible for six counties and 191 cities in Southern California, uh -huh. and they are the intermediaries with the state and with the federal government for uh, transmission of funds. Uh, SCAG is the planning and transportation sort of oversight uh, metropolitan planning organization for, right. for this region. Oh, good. So now I, I would imagine in, in trying to uh, delve deeper into this whole area and build this strategy for this for this particular part of the valley, that uh, you were met with a, a, a few challenges. Uh, that uh, uh, you mentioned a couple that were uh, previously about people not wanting to change who have been there for a while. Uh, wh what are some of the problems you're dealing with? I mean, we can certainly start in the area of poverty. Well, poverty is obviously the biggest problem. I mean, it's, it's again, you're in an area that's got some difficulties environmentally. So in the report, we have a lot of uh, uh, graphs and charts that show how it's environmentally disadvantaged. Uh, that's not necessarily somebody's fault. It's just the default condition of the Northeast Valley because it's got so much alluvial uh, sand and gravel. Mm -hmm. That's where they went and dug it out to build the county of Los Angeles. Uh -huh, so and so they were left with big holes in the ground and they had to come back and turn those into landfills uh, of various types so that they could make use of those and, and fill them back in. So right now as we see these uh, landfills being decommissioned over time, it's not going to happen overnight, right. uh, slowly but surely we have opportunities for creating green spaces, ecological spaces you can come in there and uh, one of the things that we've proposed is go in there with solar so you could do a, a infusion area below the solar and then put the solar on top of it mm -hmm. so now you're making best use out of uh, out of a piece of property that might otherwise not be suitable for construction right are these landfills brown fields or are they uh, some of them are uh, municipal waste facilities and some of them are inert matter facilities so right. it would be the, the municipal waste facilities are mostly doing methane conversion into right. power right and the inerts would be the ones that would be would be able to be repurposed into something like an infusion area right so what about in uh, this, this area? I mean, that, that certainly dealing with pollution. What about underserved communities there? Uh, some of the challenges? Part of the difficulty with underserved communities is that one of the goals of people in those communities, especially ones that are transit dependent, is they'd like to have a car so they can get somewhere. This particular community doesn't really have a transit infrastructure to speak of at all. Uh, under Measure R, which was 2008, uh, they are slated for a East Valley Transit Corridor. And that East Valley Transit Corridor is uh, uh, 9.2 miles. It'll stretch from the Metrolink station at Silmar, San Fernando, and terminate at the uh, Orange Line station in Van Nuys. Right. So this, for the first time, kind of brings this region into a, or the subregion into a uh, 21st century kind of public transportation. Mm -hmm. And it's hopeful not only to get people out of the community, but also bring new people and new business into the community. That's part of the strategy for the, for the uh, yeah. Prosperity is that is that bus or bus line <coughs> or rail? This would line? well, <laughs> under under measure R, it's probably a BRT, which is a bus rapid transit, uh, because that's all they have enough money for under measure R. I think they have 170 million dollars. Uh, under the new proposal, which will be on the ballot in November, this was just voted on last week. Uh, they would get something more like 1.2 billion and be able to do light rail. Yeah, and and these challenges, are they? Um uh, are there any other areas that really are, are, are rising up that are... I mean, like this yeah. or within yeah, there? similar. I, I think there are areas, but one of the problems that you run into is that they these areas become uh, gentrified and people get displaced. And the big concern is, who are you improving the community for? Are you improving it for some other people or right. the people who live there now? Well, we'll talk about that yeah. in a second. Yeah. You know, Greg? No, I'm just overwhelmed by projects of that magnitude and the time it takes mm -hmm. and a clarity of what the vision is the outlook is going to be because y it really can tell some interesting stories if we look at what's taking place here in Los Angeles now in portions of the valley mm -hmm. but yet it, it seems to be a very a detailed project as one would expect mm -hmm. but how often are the is the public fully engaged in the design discussions 
Uh, we certainly do the outreach. Um, not everybody uh, has the wherewithal to come out to a meeting and help us out with the kind of input we need. But uh, we've had great success uh, finding venues. You know, we went to the Vaughn Next Century Learning Center G3 Theater, uh, and we had a nice event there. I think right. we I have think a video. We actually have a video that we can screen of that event. Uh -huh. that, uh Would be great. Yeah. Give you a sense of the of that. It was a wonderful turnout with the with the wonderfully diverse group of people that turned out from all the different communities represented in that in that particular okay. room. Well, let's yeah. see the video. I know the group here is representing the foothills, which means better connectivity from Selma to Hunga through Lakeview Terrace into Selma. Yeah. <laughs> so basically we talked about, these are the two most pressing issues, mobility and then quality of life. So basically, basically we have, as we know, the public transit routes. No access to jobs, no access to medical, no access to education. Not only that, but um, we have the discovery queue now. There's no real true public transportation that goes directly to the discovery queue. Just like in Griffith Park, Metro goes into Griffith Park, the 166 could be brought into that little handsome down park area near the queue. Really quickly, we know homelessness is a problem. Alcoholic beverage outlet yes. over concentration. Yes. You guys talked about that. Um, rethink how we utilize public space. Walls, for some odd reason, tend to attract people who like to lean against them and congregate to drink and do whatever else. So we may want to rethink how we actually utilize those wall spaces. <laughs> Another good idea. Another good idea? Okay, yeah. great. Um, so, along with that comes public safety. And then also we need um, more healthcare services. Many of the people who are out there drinking or doing whatever, they have either mental health problems or substance abuse problems. We need more outreach services to those people. Um, also, we have a lack of amenities. We have the Lake Terrace Shopping Center that's underutilized. Um, it would be great to you know, bring some really nice quality jobs there, which could also you know, hopefully get more public transit there. So if we have good jobs there, good public transit there, it could help revitalize that area. We'll be right back with more Creating Good Work Live. Open your eyes. Los Angeles is one of the top destination cities for human trafficking. If you see something, say something. Call CAST. Your call remains anonymous. Interpreters available. Human trafficking is all around us. Open your eyes and let them lift theirs. Every night in America, another kid goes to bed hungry. Every day, another kid falls behind and never catches up. Not because she's not smart, not because he doesn't try hard, but because despite all the wealth in this country, their families can't make ends meet. No matter where you live, there are children in your community who are hungry. Right now, those children need someone they can count on. When you donate to support No Kid Hungry, that can be you. Together, let's make sure that no kid goes hungry. Welcome back to Creating Good Work Live on G Radio V. And we're back with uh, Bob Scott, who is, uh, <clears throat> has just finished the Northeast San Fernando Valley Sustainability and Prosperity Strategy. And Bob, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. That room, there was so much energy in the room as the lady was explaining what to people can anticipate as yes. you go forth. How many folks were in the room? Uh, usually when we have a community meeting like that, we'll have probably 100 to 150 people. That's manageable because we want to make sure everybody gets heard. So we set them in round tables. Okay. Uh, and then they 
brainstorm among themselves on various topics and then they pick a table captain who will get up like this lady did, Vanessa May, and will uh, describe what they've come up with. So it allows everybody to be part of the dialogue. Fantastic. Yeah. One other thing. Yes, sir. Let's go back and if you'll share with us, uh, with the audience again, how many people are living in that community will, that potentially will be served? Yeah, you have about 12 communities, uh, named communities, City of Los Angeles, plus uh, San Fernando, the entire city, and there's about 400,000 people in there. Yeah, so let's, let's, talk, let's go back to this notion of gentrification. Uh, I imagine that uh, it could pot the, this process could potentially displace uh, some of the current residents, and I'm sure there's also some concern among those hundreds of people who showed up at these different events, of which I attended a number of them, and they were really quite vital and quite, quite uh, engaged. So uh, what, what, what's, what is your plan around gentrification? There's a, there's, a, there's a concept out there that was originally floated, I think, by uh, the author Joel Kotkin, who's also author and lecturer, mm -hmm. and our Dr. Michael Shires, who's on our team, uh, called Opportunity Urbanism. And the idea is while you're improving the neighborhood, you have to improve the prosperity of the people in that neighborhood. Part of that is done, in our belief, by innovation and entrepreneurship, by getting people involved, by taking that one person in 10 or one person in 20 who's potentially an entrepreneur, identifying them and setting up local businesses. There's huge demand for a lot of the amenities that just don't exist there for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect situation for setting up transit-oriented districts, that is districts that are built very close to transit, like within a half a mile, so people can actually live, work, uh, shop, recreate, all within the uh, distance of the transit station. And then they can catch transit if they need to go to the rest of the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So, well, go ahead. Would you give consideration in the future as you're stepping out with the development of the various aspects of, of this initiative? Mm -hmm. Would you bring some of the uh, uh, outlines so that we, uh, we could share with the audience the vision that you have in moving forward? Let's request for more. The, the, the outlines? Yes, the, uh, the visual outlines, something that could be shared in the future as you're moving oh, this sure. initiative forward. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. good. So how, how are you going to deal with uh, homelessness and, and housing in the area? It seems like homelessness will always be a problem, and some of the areas along the Big Tahunga Wash and some of those areas have become de facto campgrounds for homeless people. Uh, it's problematic because they do come into the neighborhoods and they do challenge the quality of life in those neighborhoods because I, I won't pass judgment on people who need things, but they tend to cause problems in, in the community. So uh, some of what may be happening with some of the newer initiatives, uh, there are a lot of uh, social uh, service type agencies there. There's the meet opportunity, meet each need with dignity. Uh, there are a number of other shelters and healthcare facilities. I don't think you're ever going to get completely rid of it, but sometimes there's a way to accommodate it. And I don't think what they've done so far with the concentration of liquor stores and the homelessness and, you know, that, that carries with it some amount of um, discouragement on those people's part, which leads to habits of drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's difficult. Somehow you need to come up with a way to contain it. This strategy is more like a toolbox. So there's not a specific answer for every question, but there's a set of tools in there that people can go to, take a look at it, and find out what they need to find out to maybe solve one or two of the problems. And hopefully the planners, as we go forward, we did this in Northridge, the, the LA City, plan, uh, City Council actually approved our vision document as a guide for future planning. So next time they do community plans in the area, this is something they can refer to and it's already been vetted by the community. Uh -huh. Another question I have is, are there a lot of veterans who are homeless in that part of uh, the, the region? We don't have the stats on that, but my short answer would be yes, we believe so, because uh, when you're down and out, you're homeless, you have a tendency to gravitate toward places where homeless uh, find themselves and you're not going to find usually so many homeless people in Encino or Woodland Hills but you're certainly going to find them in Silmar or Sunland Tahunga. So well, let's let's talk about employment then because employment seems to be an important aspect of this jobs and, and jobs for the people who live in this area uh, where are these where are these jobs going to come from? 
the effort was made to try to identify as much in the way of green jobs and clean tech jobs as possible. Some of the initiatives that took place four and five years ago have, have sputtered out a little bit in terms of what can be identified as a green job. In the report, we discuss how that's, how that's calculated. Uh, but by the same token, the way we see it, we have the aerospace uh, infrastructure that's already here that has not been being used the way it should, and we have the fabrication capabilities that uh, Joint Ventures Silicon Valley doesn't have because mm -hmm. they're working in a whole different scale. And so we should very well be able to compete in terms of manufacturing, especially if the whole dollars and cents uh, uh, equation can be worked out. So uh, let, let's talk about the resources. Uh, I mean, something doing something like this is going to be uh, is not going to be inexpensive. Uh, what resources can be brought to bear on this project? The, the difficulty, obviously, when you're a government, you can calculate what your tax revenues and return funds are going to be. Uh, when you're private sector or your public-private partnership, you have to work a little harder at figuring out and identifying resources. As we see it for the people who live in this area, just like that lady you saw there uh, just talking, Vanessa May. She's one of those people who's already gone out and she's working to get some sidewalks put in and some uh, uh, infusion areas along the sidewalks to capture stormwater runoff because that's basically the headwaters of the San Fernando Valley uh, aquifer. So the idea of capturing water in that area is very important. So you, you, take, you start with somebody like that. They go out and they find someone who can write up those grant applications. They find a, a jurisdiction that can apply for the grants and then you start building it, but you have to have a constructive approach to it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most community groups tend toward being opposed to more things than they're in favor of. Uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> what you have to do is be a little more sophisticated if you really want to get the job done. Even, even in a community that, is, that you're trying to improve? Correct. And, and Oh yeah, no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But the idea here is that if you get the human capital in first, mm -hmm. those are the people that can make it happen, and we're doing that right now, moving forward on that. And then you bring in uh, some people who can maybe make some contributions, foundations, public-private partnerships, and then you get a grant writing capability so that you can go out and go after those larger grants that are out there, especially government grants. You can right. do it through the cities. You can do it through basically any jurisdiction. We have a new, uh, as of 2010, we have a Southern Cal uh, San Fernando Valley, uh, uh, what, what is it? What, what is it called? The cog. I, I can't help. Uh, oh, San Fernando Valley uh, uh, <laughs> Conference of Governors. No, Con Council of Governors. Thank of you government. very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah there we go. I, the, uh, the, the San Fernando Valley the Council of Governments is a new cog. yeah is a new entity we didn't have before. So we right. now have a metro <laughs> planning subregion. We have a a um, SCAG planning subregion, and we also have the ability to have a jurisdiction that can help us. Uh, work these other deals. So I, I, we've got one more video, a very short video that okay. uh, from uh, from somebody at the uh, who speaking at one of these events that I think is also also worth hearing uh, as we wrap up this up. It's uh, if it's any help to you, invisible possible was the was what, don't mean to give away the punchline. <laughs> Well, if, it's, if, if, if we can't find it, we can just move on. But, uh, and, and so, but I, I do want to talk about one thing, Bob, that I know is of interest to you, which is this, this area of um, civic entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you could explain how this all plays into this whole process. Well, civic entrepreneurs are, for all intents and purposes, volunteers, not to say that they can't also be participating in teams. But civic entrepreneurs are people that uh, you could say in today's uh, jargon call them interrupters. These are people who see something that needs to be done and they jump into the middle of it and they, and they cause it to be done. They figure out how it's going to work. They gather together a team. This would be what I'd call that human capital piece. Mm -hmm. You need those people to start, civic entrepreneurs. And they're the ones that take stewardship over their community and over the area. Uh, they have a different role than an elected official. They have a different role than a for-profit. They have a different role even than a charitable organization. These are people who are like Ron Schultz, you know, people who take this on, they believe in it, and, they, and they're out there uh, carrying the message to as many people as they can get to listen. Greg, Greg anything? And there are a lot of people who are excited about what you're sharing today. 
is there, if someone would like to come and be part of this wonderful plan in volunteering as a community mm -hmm. resident, where should they go? First stop would be northeaststrategy.org, mm -hmm. and they can pick up a copy of the report there. It's online. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other tools and, and uh, reports and materials at that location. <clears throat> and then our main, our, our main site is mulhollandinstitute.org, uh, and that's uh, another place they can see more of what we do as, a, as an organization. Okay. Oh, well, we'll close there. Yes. All right. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so thank you, Bob. Thank I appreciate you. your thank time you today. Much. And I hope uh, you wish you all the success with this, with this venture. I think that certainly the, the Northeast Valley deserves it, doesn't it? It certainly yeah. does. Yeah. They've Thanks been a so. long time waiting. Yes. Thank you. I think we also need to celebrate what we have done. Those of us who've been here 30, 40 years Really, go out there and speak positively about ourselves. And this way we build the confidence, as I need to say, among ourselves, that yes, we can make the change. Definitely there's a city hall, LAPD, and all that, but ultimately, we make the change. We pick up a piece of trash, the kids pick up a piece of trash, everybody pick up, and we have a lot of pickups. So I hope that we'll stay connected, Yes, it can be done. If we can see the invisible, we can do the impossible. Thank you. There's more to come on Creating Good Work Live. Arizona State University where I am a change leader and I'm the director of social embeddedness. So part of my role as a change leader as that liaison between Ashoka and the institution is making sure that we have a chance to learn from the other institutions and I can then help take those best practices from other universities and share them with my colleagues here at ASU and also share what we're doing here at ASU that we're proud of and then help put that out to the Changemaker campuses. So that role of liaison and connector, I think are very important aspects of being a change leader. As the number of institutions in the Changemaker campus consortium continue to grow, my hope is that we will at some point reach a critical mass where we are not a small consortium in a sea of institutions, but instead we are the norm in higher education, which is that most institutions are committed to this type of change-making effort and realize that it's time to shake things up in higher ed. Surviving an assault is never easy, and the questions which flow only add to the trauma. Most victims are not ready to talk right away. With I've Been Violated app, survivors can confidentially record their story simply by talking into their phone. The record they create is doubly encrypted and stored securely offline, accessible only through the proper authorities. The I've Been Violated app helps prove survivors' credibility when they are ready to seek the help they need. And now, here's Ron and Greg. Yes, and we're back. And um, our, our guest for the uh, second half of our show is uh, Charles Fullwood. And uh, Charles is a, a media and communication strategist who pioneered global media campaigns and the use of commercial marketing uh, techniques for nonprofit organizations. And over a 15-year period, period beginning in the mid-1980s, he served as a communications director for Amnesty International, uh, Amnesty International USA, uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and the Children's Defense Fund. Uh, Fullwood was uh, chief media strategist for the Human Rights Now Tour, and he is also credited with designing the campaign strategy that led to 18 states to pass legislation that exempts juveniles from the death penalty. He is a founding partner in, a media, in Media Vision USA, a strategic communication firm that specializes in litigation communications, crisis communications, and media campaigns. And he's a member of the teaching faculty at John Hopkins University uh, on the, in their program on communications and contemporary society. 
and he has been a lifelong friend of uh, Mr. Frank's here. Uh, we are very pleased to have you with us, Charles. Thank you. He is coming to us. Me? Yeah, well, I can hear you and I can see you, and so can Greg. You look great. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, Charles, as a, as a communication authority, it certainly makes sense for us to focus on the media and its coverage of the current campaign. And, and we'd like to hear how, how you see this coverage uh, framing how we are treating specific issues. So uh, why don't we begin, since there's a, a lot going on here, with climate change? Well, uh, yeah, we, basically we're losing our minds every day because the uh, media is covering the campaign like a horse race and uh, with the subset covering it like it's a reality uh, television show. So the focus is more on personality and on tweets from Donald Trump and uh, uh, email, the email investigation of, uh, of Hillary and up until recently the, uh, the, the campaign of, of Bernie Sanders. So now that the Sanders campaign is um, basically over, even though he, he refuses to, to, to withdraw technically, he still has Secret Service protection at about $40,000 a day. And the Attorney General just about an hour ago announced that there, there, that she will be accepting the recommendations of the FBI and no charges will be filed against Hillary Clinton. Uh, but this morning, the Republicans in the House announced that they'll be holding hearings first thing in the morning uh, to question uh, the FBI director on, on why uh, there was no recommendation to, to indict. So basically, the media follows uh, the the, uh, the car wrecks, and there's very little uh, focus on the issues that matter to people uh, be, beyond sort of a, a rubbernecking syndrome of, or looking at a car accident, or what Trump tweeted lately, or what sort of inventic scandals they're imposing on on uh, Hillary. Um, so. People have the, the result of, of this is that people do not understand the urgency uh, of climate change mitigation, uh, and most of the public doesn't even understand what it is. Um, but now we know that uh, erratic and extreme weather is getting the attention of the public, even though, even if they don't understand the science of uh, clim climate change, and they know that something is uh has gone wrong we knew that uh, when katrina hit new orleans uh and we we've, we've known it over summers where there were 100 100 degree days uh in places like chicago and washington where you know there have been a number of deaths of elderly people uh, who were exposed to heat or extreme winters uh where we've had uh, below zero degree weather in regions where that's almost unheard of. So we know that there's been extreme weather events and erratic uh, weather patterns that are that, that are breaking with tradition, uh, but there's still confusion in, in uh, the body of, pu of public consciousness about this. And one reason for that is because the media has covered it uh, with a, a sense of a, a frame of false equivalency. Uh, a worldwide consensus among climate scientists have concluded that human beings are contributing to climate change and, and uh, global warming, and that we need to address that in a fundamental, urgent manner by moving to alternative fuels away from fossil fuels, and we need to change our habits in, in terms of human consumption uh, from transportation to electricity, to alternative forms of, of energy. But instead of them focusing on the merits and the complexity and the risks and the consequences and the possible solutions and what it takes to implement those solutions, the media has instead gone to those people who oppose um, or, don't, or don't believe that there is a climate change threat and presenting it as if it is a legitimate debate. Mm. Um, it is almost as if one group of doctors told you that you had lung cancer, and the media went to the local uh, service station to ask the mechanic, what did he think about that? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's the same kind of thing, you know, where 
uh, you know, a report will be issued by the UN um, uh, body on climate change, a consensus of, of, of climate scientists worldwide, and then they'll go to uh, a conservative Republican in the House and ask him what he thinks of it, and he has absolutely no expertise. So consequently, you'll get Senator um, Cochran, I believe it was, who uh, brought a uh, snowball in on the floor of the Senate, you know, a as a stunt to, to supposedly prove that there was no global warming, which is a complete distortion of yeah. the merits of the issue in the first place. It's, it's uh, going, it going to the to the to the quietest voice, who uh, <clears throat> rather than really seeing uh, what what the whole forest is, what's happening to the forest. Well, yeah, and actually, it has very little to do with it. Even though we are having extreme um, heat and extreme cold, uh, global warming is really about the warming of the oceans, which has to do with the rise of the oceans and its effect on agriculture and its melting of the polar caps, which in turn uh, aggravates the problem even more. And we're now experiencing that where polar bears are are uh, at risk now because of ice melting. It's similar to what happens in, in, on, in the western region where their drinking water supplies are depleting, the reservoirs are, are dry because you haven't had any snowpack that melts into water to fill those reservoirs, which is caused by the lack of rain in, in that particular region, which aggravates the problem of fire uh, in the forests, etc. And so this was presented in, 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 uh, in the wrong way by, by media, in part because initially the reporters covering it had no, no understanding of this complexity. And because there's this, this mentality about there's always got to be another side to a particular issue, which may, you know oftentimes is true, but, but you need to go to someone who knows what they're talking about if you're going to go to the, the so-called other side. So consequently, we have had 30 and 40 years of, uh, of distortion about this issue. So now we're stuck with uh, ever-increasing consequences that will disproportionately, it'll, it'll affect everyone, but it's going to disproportionately yeah. affect poor people so and disproportionately affect middle-class people uh, and people who live in coastal areas, particularly poor people who live in areas where there is no infrastructure to protect them. Hey Charles, a couple of things I want to ask you in advance, in advance of, of, of what is being discussed. What is going to be the position with regard to the Democratic Party as well as the NRDC as we move forward in this most crucial election? Well, NRDC is, is a tax-exempt organization, and uh, they can't endorse uh, political candidates. But they have been a leader in this field of climate change. They, they pioneered this, this field along with some other organ, uh, environmental organizations. So they've been on record for, for over uh, 30 years, in, and, and even more than, than 30 years, that this is a legitimate threat. Um, but for the first time in, in their history, NRDC's 501c4 organizational um, uh, entity has endorse Hillary Clinton, um, you know, as president of Canada. And that's because the stakes are so high. Uh, we're, we, we are almost, some scientists believe that it actually may be too late. Um, uh, but, but the majority of them believe that we can still um, mitigate the fundamentals, but it will take fundamental and drastic radical action um, in order to, to avert possible catastrophe. And it, you know, we'll be inconvenienced and some of us, you know, will, uh, you know, will be injured or, or maybe even lose our lives. But our grandchildren and their children will, will face the catastrophic consequences of this if nothing, nothing is done. So, you know, th this, this, this is a real life example of how media covers something like a horse race with false equivalence that results in inaction in Congress, no policy or legislative remedy, and no enforcement of, of laws to eliminate or mitigate the problem. And so we're stuck with the consequences, and, and, and the generation following us will be stuck with the consequences. 
in the presidential race, as an example, uh, Trump has made it clear that he doesn't believe in, in uh, climate change. He thinks it's a Chinese hoax. I mean, <laughs> this is, this is a, the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party, a major political party in the United States. Uh, and he is saying that climate change, in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, he is saying that it is a Chinese hoax. Um, whereas the Democratic Party and, and the presumptive nominee, Hillary Clinton, you know, on record of having specific legislative uh, proposals in the pipeline to address this, you know, and the major part of that is moving to alternative sources of energy and moving away from fossil fuels, but doing it in a way that is not fatally disruptive to the economy and, and that will create jobs instead of losing jobs, which is the, 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 the mantra of the Republicans saying that it, it would destroy the economy Right. And it would lose, lose jobs. So, Charles, I want to I want to get to. Uh, we're we're going to have to take a break here in a second. But what I what I'd like to do is come back to some of the the ways that we can deal with these issues, because there we we know that yeah. this is true that the that this has been true in the areas of of voter ID and voter suppression. We know it's been true in the areas of uh, of race bigotry and and anti-Semitism and and fear of Muslims and fear of the other. And so I, I want to talk, when we get back, we want to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the solutions. And so uh, we're going to take a, a, a short break here. All and, right. um, and then we'll be back and, uh, with talking to uh, Charles Fullwood. So I can, I can uh, eat the donuts and uh, drink the coffee in the green room while I'm waiting on you guys. You got, Absolutely. You got, you, 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 <laughs> I had them sent over. Yeah. <laughs> You're watching Creating Good Work Live on T-Radio V. Most anti-bullying efforts rely heavily on bystanders to take action, leaving your child with no protection. The No app aims to change that. Now your child can summon the assistance of a policewoman to tell the bully no, and you get alerted in real time with a map of your child's location. With video evidence, the bully's parents can be confronted and school officials can be forced to take action. You get increased peace of mind and your child gets increased self-confidence. Sustainable Law Group is a different type of law firm. Our clients are primarily social enterprises, nonprofits, and green businesses. Our mission is to provide legal counsel that is aligned with our clients' values by providing integrated, sustainable, and comprehensive solutions. We're a full-service law firm Starting a benefit corporation, cooperative or nonprofit, the attorneys at the Sustainable Law Group are ready to support you in all stages of your business. Find out more about Sustainable Law Group at sustainablelawyer.com. We're back with Ron and Greg. And I, I'm hoping that uh, Charles has made it back from the donuts and the coffee. Uh, and is here with us. So uh, go ahead, Greg. Why don't you why don't you move into this next area, Charles? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm one of the areas that I'd like for you to uh, comment on is with the the voter su suppression. So many years and all the things that we had to do throughout the '60s and '70s, and uh, and and so much was built around voter su suppression. What can we anticipate at this stage as we move forward? And how, which parties, uh, what do you anticipate from the Democratic Party in addressing this and the Republican Party? Well, the Republicans have been successful in a, in a number of states in passing voter ID laws where uh, a special government ID will be required. And uh, many people don't have those because you have to have a birth certificate in order to get them, and many people don't have birth certificates, et cetera. So th there will be a lot of those shenanigans. And uh, there are some states, I think Georgia is one of them, that, that it is even going to require proof of citizenship. Uh, it's my understanding that the Democratic Party will be challenging um, at the polls, uh, you know, and in, in, irregularities, but they won't be able to challenge the enforcement of those state laws, such as what exists in the state of, of North Carolina 
and some others. Um, and the, here is another uh, example of where the media has done us a disservice. They've, they've, they've covered this issue with the false equivalency or the phony both sides argument. Mm -hmm. The Republicans say you needed voter ID laws because of massive voter fraud. And study after study over the years, including most recently, proves that there is no evidence of voter fraud whatsoever. In fact, the only instances of voter fraud uh, has been committed by the registrars trying to prevent people from voting or manipulating uh, voting uh, vote, vote counts uh, to, to favor their particular candidates. So, but still, the media persists in covering this as. Um, as as a possibility of voter fraud merely because Republicans are saying it, there's no evidence whatsoever, you know, versus uh, the insinuation of what is the big deal about getting an ID. And oftentimes those are onerous uh, uh, challenges for older people, for students in some, some states. Uh, the students have to uh, vote back in their, their home uh, districts as opposed to voting where they are attending school for four years, you know, college students, et cetera. But what I wanted to say about some of the solutions to this is um, because you have uh, such media consolidation now where uh, a tiny group of, of companies own all of the media, there's no competition. So, you know, when they present one point of view on their radio station and the same point of view in the, in the newspaper and the same point of view and their uh, television station, there's not much you can do about it. And one of the reasons that you can't is because uh, Reagan eliminated the Fairness Doctrine in 1987. And, and that doctrine was created by FCC in 1949 that basically said when controversial issues are covered by the media, they have to allow the opportunity for the opposing side to present their point of view. Uh, well, when the doc Fairness Doctrine, when uh, Reagan vetoed the legislation for that in 1987, and it accompanied the increasing consolidation and media monopoly uh, throughout the country, it, it squeezed out uh, any uh, point of view. The other thing that accompanied that was the rise of right-wing media, which had a steady drumbeat of uh, ideologically packaged so-called news. Um, and there was an, an adequate response from, from the mainstream news because they were owned by some of the corporations that were advertising on the right wing uh, radio and, and television stations, et cetera. So one of the things that, that we need to, the people need to do, and by people I mean, first of all, organized groups need to uh, start challenging these news stations and editorial boards on, on their coverage and on their policies, their editorial policies. Uh, we are readers, we are consumers of products, we can contact sponsors through organized campaigns. Uh, but what I would really like to see is an organized effort to challenge the license renewals of these networks and these cable stations when they come up for renewal of their licenses, because the airways are not owned by them, they are owned by the public. The, the airways do not belong to them, they belong to us. And they are using them on a licensed basis, and they should be able to, we should be able to hold them accountable for their practices in these local communities in terms of local news, as well as national news, because the case can be made that this kind of coverage is not in the public's interest. It is, you know, traditionally we refer to the media as fourth estate. Well, it's not that anymore. Uh, the Washington Post is not your, your mama's Washington Post. Uh, you, the, the day of investigative journalism is almost dead because uh, we, they have squeezed the budget out and, and focused on entertainment and sports instead. And, of course, the Internet has a lot to do with right. that. Too. So, so, Charles, I want to I ask you about, you know, the, this, this kind of how this thing gets reframed, how these things take place. And there's, there, there's, there are a couple questions here, but one is when we hear Donald Trump call the press dishonest and folks within the press corps following them being liars and terrible, despicable people. There, there are larger consequences to this. I, I wonder if you can elaborate on how this kind of attack on the press depletes the credibility of the media to do its, really, to do its job. Well, you know, uh, a, a part of the, the, 
the problem with that is the uh, sort of feeble response of the press. Um, and, and it's my view that the candidacy of Donald Trump is, is viable now in the practical sense because of the media. Mm -hmm. they, they covered this man for months because it produced good ratings. They absorbed his attacks on them because they chuckled and they laughed about it as their ratings went up and they increased their advertising revenues. But they, they never really took him to task until it was too late. So the consequence of it is that his message has stuck with a lot of people who are rightfully cynical about the media for their own reasons. Um, but, but now that they are trying to respond, it's too late now because they, he's had almost a year of repeating the same message over and over and over again. And because there's never really been a substantive response by media to take him on, and, and they've had ample evidence of over 3,000 lawsuits filed against him, of him stiffing contractors and small businesses and workers when he has walked away from, from properties and when he's filed for bank. For instance, in Atlantic City, he filed for bankruptcy four times and walked away and left everyone and stiffed every, everyone. Uh, this man is a con artist, and yet he was covered as, as some sort of populist candidate, uh, which is absolutely absurd. It's, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, now, uh, it's our understanding that the Washington Post has assigned 20 reporters to covering him, but he's almost ready to be nominated. And he has a large constituency now. Th this is someone before that would be your drunk uncle, you know, out in the backyard talking at Thanksgiving, you know, a, a, a babbling nonsense or somebody at the corner grocery store talking. But because they gave him uh, visibility and exposure, so an uncritical exposure, um, he found a constituency and people now believe that he's a populist. Okay, Charles, we want to thank you for the time that you have given us today. And is there a location where many of our viewers may be interested in finding out more about some of your research work uh, in what's taking place currently throughout the country? Is there a location that folks can reach out to you? Well, they can reach out to me at uh, MediaVisionUSA.net, uh, which is my website, you know, or uh, my Facebook page, which is Charles Simke Fullwood on uh, Facebook. Um, but for other information about the media, I would strongly recommend the State of Media 2016 uh, by the Pew Foundation. And uh, it has a tremendous amount of information, factual information and analysis of the media. Um, but beyond that, you know, I would just suggest that people go to credible news sources uh, online, yeah. Huffington Post, Black Voices. Uh, there's a whole array of them. You know, we have unlimited sources of information now, but people have to use it. So, Charles, again, th thank you for this. We're going to have you back on the show uh, if sometime. We're hoping the 1st of August to uh, to talk some more about these issues and to also to, to talk about the, uh, the rather remarkable video that you're producing. And, uh, you know, our time frame, our time is, is, is short here. But we were happy for you that you could introduce yourself and, and really your brilliance into this whole process. And again, thank you for that time. Thank you. Time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. So uh, we want to thank you all for being here with us at Creating Good Work Live. It's, uh, it, this has been a really interesting show for us with some, uh, some, uh, some important concepts being talked about. And we uh, intend to continue that throughout this process. Yes. So we thank you, and we say, we bid you a fine to do it. Yes. <laughs> Creating Good Work Live is a production of the Social Action Media Network on T Radio V. You are watching T-Radio V, radio and TV.